Hey everybody, welcome to the very last lecture of the year. Today, it's not even really much of a lecture. I don't even really need to do it other than I want to talk about the exam. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the quiz tomorrow. I'm sorry for getting this up so late. The quiz tomorrow is based on the, whatever's in the text about Rhizaria, which is, I think, almost nothing, plus the reading I assigned, um, Berkey and Keeling. That's a really good reading. It's really short, but it's well written and interesting. So the, the quiz tomorrow is based on that reading. So please check it out. Um, and at the end of this little introduction to Rhizaria, I will talk about the exam. Okay, so Rhizaria, we've looked at everything in the eukarya except for Rhizaria, right? We've looked at alveolata, um, Straminopola, plants, um, Archaeoplastida, or plants and algal relatives, Excavata, Amoebozoa, Opisticanta. All that's left to look at is Rhizaria. And they're only looking at three groups in Rhizaria, the radiolarians, the chlorachnophytes, and the foraminifera. I want you to become familiar with what these three groups and kind of the mystery of the radial area. This is a group that's really recent. It's only the 90s that people have put these organisms together. It's only since molecular evidence that we know that such divergent organisms have a common ancestor, okay? So it's a new group, it's a big group, it's kind of a funky group, there's a lot of diversity in it. The classification of the system, this um, group has been debated and continues to be debated. However, molecular evidence does support them as a monophyletic group. There's not a lot of photosynthesis, photosynthesis in this group. There is some, um, but there's all sorts of nutritional modes. And we've been talking mostly about nutritional modes when we've talked about um, eukarya. So it's kind of important when you think about it, right? I'm trying to get you to think about what it means to be a eukaryote how things have differed, how evolution has unfolded, what makes a eukaryote a eukaryote, right? So I want you to, you know, as you're preparing for the end of the semester and the final exam, think about those major themes. Um, okay, so Rhizaria, these things are small, unicellular. They're mostly amoebic. There's some mixotrophy, so there's some uh, photosynthesis. Mostly they're heterotrophs. Historically, these guys were considered animals. Um, not sure why once you see them because they, well, okay, some of them, the foraminifera totally look like animals. Um, but again, this is a group of these little tiny, beautiful creatures that are just exquisite and make you wanna cry with how beautiful nature is. Okay, so I just want you to have some visual images of these organisms before you do your readings. The first group, foraminifera, these are called, well, foraminifera is whole bearers. There's a ton, there's a crap ton of these guys. I mean, over 50,000 species that we know about. Um, these little guys usually pr produce a cell that's called a test. They're marine, they live in the benthos of the ocean. Um, they're very, very important in Arctic system and in benthos systems. But if you looked at them, you can see why people would think these are animals, right? They look like little mollusks. Another example of convergent evolution isn't evolution crazy? How could this evolve in such a wildly different group of organisms? But it did. Some of these are even pretty big. And when I mean pretty big, I mean like they're like a millimeter, right? They're not anything like the mollusk shells that we see, but um, they're big for, um, they're big for protist. And as such, They've left a really good, oops, sorry, they've left a really good fossil record, right? Because they've got these calcium carbonate shells that you can really see in the fossil record. And of course, if you, you cut them crosswise, they look nothing like a mollusk, right? They don't have a body. They're not multicellular. They're really sim simple, simple organisms. Um, these guys host endosymbiotic um, algae. This is not exactly what I want, but let's have a look. Uh, never mind, never mind. Um, here we go. What is this? This is not the this is not the video I wanted to show you. However, it's kind of interesting. It gives you a sense of what these organisms are like. Okay, let's just let's just forget about that. Let's forget about that. Um, I wanted to show you this organism and all the dinoflagellates around it. It's not that. Okay, chlorarachnophytes. I like these. These are like chlor is green and arachnophytes are spider plants. Green spider plants. How cool is that? 
There's not very many of them. And originally they were thought to be xanthophytes. You can see because they have chloroplasts. So these are, these are photosynthetic. They're not, um, they're not endosymbionts. They are their own chloroplasts, but these are secondary chloroplasts because they're nucleomorphs, right? You can see the nucleus residue from the organism that these guys engulfed. So way back in the day, the chloroplasts were free living photosynthetic protists but now they belong to the chlorachniophytes. And they're spiders because they have all these pseudopods that kind of look all spidery. Um, but these guys are mixotrophs, right? They can be heterotrophs and they can be phototrophs, but they're kind of cool. I mean, they're really cool. Um, in the reading this week, there's about these vampire chlorachniophytes. I mean, whew, really cool stuff. Last group I want to talk about in this, in the rice area are the radiolarians. Uh, radiolarians predictably are absolutely stunning. They are gorgeous. They are works of art, every single one of them. I mean, look at that little organism. Doesn't it break your heart how beautiful nature is? There's, there's quite a few of them. There's about um, 8,000 of them. They're, they, they exist as zooplankton, that's their ecological role. And these guys host algal symbiotes. So they're not chloro they're not photosynthetic themselves, but they do, they're mixotrophs because they get some um, carbon from the algae that they host. Um, and they can host all sorts of different kind of symbionts, right? They're pretty promiscuous when it comes to this. It's not a strict one-on-one -on -one relationship. Okay, so I know I feel like I rushed to that. I wanna get this online quickly, but the whole point of this lecture was just to give you a visual idea of these organisms. I want you to read the reading today if you haven't already, it's been online over the weekend. It's really good. I think you'll like it. Um, but let's talk about the exam. So I've been thinking and thinking and thinking how to give you this exam. And this isn't the exam question. This is just, this is going to give you an idea of the approach so you can start preparing. It will be an essay, 200, 300 words, not super long. Don't I want you to read, write me a book. I just want you to write, you know, you're typing it, it would be one page double space or maybe one and a half pages double space, maximum two. Definitely that's probably too much, that's like 500. So let's say one to one and a half pages double space typing. You get to choose the topic, but I will ask you questions dealing with the topics below. Based on what you pick, you will get the specific question on the day of the exam. So for example, you could choose to look at the role of endosymbiosis in the evolution of eukarya. This has been a huge theme we've talked, at, talked about since the beginning, all the way from um, endosymbionts to endosymbiosis and everything in between. You could talk about the ecological role of protists. I've tried to emphasize that too, right? They do all sorts of different things in ecosystems. Or you could talk about what makes eukarya to eukarya, right? Eukarya is quite a diverse group of mix. It's a mixed bag of organisms, right? It's not like bacteria and archaea. Think about bacteria and archaea. Yeah, there's a ton of genetic diversity and biochemical diversity, but when you look at them, they kind of don't have a lot of morphological differentiation or size differentiation. You carry a huge microscopic, photosynthetic, chemoheterotrophs, they're all over the place. So I want you to think about that. So I will give you the specific exam. I don't, I want you to, um, I don't know how I'm gonna do this logistically, but basically you will, you'll choose one of these questions to prepare for your final exam. And then on the day exam, you'll get a more focused, directed question. How does that say? Please give me feedback. I'd like to know what you think about this. I want this to be fair. I don't want there to be cheating, but I want it to be fair and I want it to be representative of the, the kind of the, the way we've done the class this year. Um, okay, that's all I have to say. Let me know, give me feedback. Tell me what you think. All right. I will talk to you soon on Friday for our last meeting, but um, make sure to give me feedback because I don't know how to really properly give an exam under these conditions. I think this will work though, right? It's going to be open book, so I want a little bit of surprise though, right? Because 
otherwise you'll just all work together and share information. I want this to be your own original thought. I want you to wrestle with what we've talked about over the semester and come up with your own take on it. Okay, let me know what you think.